Can you tell people what you do for a living? Здравствуйте, everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, I do politics uh, in the sense of practical politics. That is to say, uh, whenever you see someone shilling on the internet, someone like me in the background has wrote has written those talking points. That's essentially what I do. That's what the political operatives do. Right. So for the first question, um, imagine you're a British citizen or maybe <laughs> an American citizen. And you notice uh, how the media likes to say the Putin gas hikes. Mm -hmm. How would you convince an American or a British that uh, it's worth supporting the uh, conflict in Ukraine, the, the war in Ukraine? Well, first of all, <clears throat> there is, uh, at least in the case of the United States, the, the whole notion of Putin gas hike is ridiculous. Uh, it's just not true at all. Uh, you can call it the Biden gas hike if you want, if you really have to put the name of a politician on it. Uh, Putin is responsible for uh, price increases in the energy sector in contin in, on continental Europe in, in general, but not in continental United States. In continental United States, the issue is cancelling various pipelines that were supposed to uh, be built, um, lowering the amount of federal land where drilling is permitted and all of that. So that's where, uh, that's who's at fault. So, you know, who, who regulates that? Well, it's usually the presidency. So, you know, call your president on that. Uh, so this idea that uh, Americans are suffering uh, through an energy crisis, which is anyway much lower than it is in Europe, uh, because of the war in Ukraine is ridiculous. So you don't, you don't even have to convince American citizens to support the war in Ukraine in this uh, particular sub-threat because the two are not connected. Whereas in general, yes, the um, American taxpayer is going to, is already footing some of the bill and will probably continue to do so throughout the duration, at least of the uh, what we call uh, active phase of the conflict. Now, the, when it comes to these kinds of wars where uh, there is general agreement from the uh, center left to the center right, there is always uh, an influx of mixed interests. So, for instance, uh, those who not necessarily support Russia, but definitely are skeptical of the Western narrative, when they point out, look, there's a lot of money being laundered through the Ukrainian war effort. Yes. But there's also a lot of very useful equipment being sent there that helps Ukraine uh, to, its, uh, uh, to fulfill its goal of defeating the invaders. So both are true. And rejecting one uh, for ideological reasons leads one to uh, reach wrong conclusions. So yes, there is corruption as in any war. All wars are business so, and all business uh, based on war ends up having some... Uh, elements of corruption in it. It's just, it is what it is. Uh, also, most American citizens, when it comes to British citizens, it's easier uh, because British citizens are much more connected, including physically with continental Europe. So it's much easier. Most of them understand these things in intuitively. But with American citizens, it's a bit more difficult. And that's why the Russian propaganda focuses a lot more on Americans than uh, on British citizens. Uh, most American citizens simply do not know what is their personal benefit uh, out exactly. of this. Uh, most American citizens think that uh, if tomorrow the United States would withdraw uh, from all over the world, nothing will change for the worse inside the United States. But that's just not true, uh, especially considering that most of manufacturing is done outside of the United States. All of that has to be uh, transported back to the United States. Well, how, is, how does that happen? Well, it happens through this region of the world and through the South China Sea. So you know, that's why Taiwan and Ukraine matter so much. Uh, and the other way around too, there's a lot of American investment in uh, not just Ukraine itself, but also neighboring countries of Ukraine. And uh, the federal government has assumed the, this role ever since the times of the founding fathers, not this morning. Uh, assume the role of protecting American investment abroad. Well, if that stops, then most of that American investment would end up either be, uh, being destroyed by either Russia or China or being taken over by and looted by Russia or China. So, and that will immediately be seen into the uh, standard of living of most American citizens. So no, there is an, an intertwined interest. And yes, that also means uh, some elements of corruption. American citizens will have to learn that 
the world functions on corruption too. It's a part of human nature. It, it's, it will never stop. The best you can do is try to manage. Corruption is a phenomenon that you manage. You don't stop. And that's why I laugh about uh, anti-corruption initiatives, especially here in Romania. Oh, we're going to stamp out corruption. No, you won't. No, you won't. You can't. You can manage it better. And the United States manages corruption pretty well. Maybe they could do a better job, but that's pretty much it. And mm, most of the objections to the support to the U.S. support of uh, the Ukraine war is uh, based on either naivete or uh, or bad faith, essentially, especially considering that as opposed to other war efforts, which were far more damaging to the United States. This one doesn't even in involve um, American citizens wasting their lives. And no American has died in this war and likely no American will. So yeah. it's much easier to support this war effort than uh, others. And besides, most of the direct expenses uh, falls on us, uh, on, uh, on Romania, or on Poland, on Hungary, on Germany, yes. So no, it's not like the US is disproportionately affected. If anything, it's probably slightly less affected. I noticed a very interesting trend where up until now, right wingers were the ones that uh, viewed themselves as uh, nationalistic, mm -hmm. as uh, patriotic, um, not just by themselves, but by everyone around. And meanwhile, the left believed that uh, places like America is a systemic racist country. Mm -hmm. uh, but now with the war, some people have shifted, especially mm -hmm. the extremes. Mm -hmm. We see the far left being incredibly patriotic and saying that if you don't support the war effort, then uh, you're an anti-American. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And we have seen the far right being like, oh no, if you do support this war, then uh, you're supporting uh, all of the excesses from uh, the, the I, I guess, like the Western culture with mm -hmm. uh, you know diversity, inclusion, equity, so on and so forth. H how do you view this shift? It's not a shift. It's always the characteristic of the extremes. And uh, the untold truth is that most of the time the extremes have a point. And the reason they're extremes is because the solutions they propose are untenable. But the fundamentals are correct. I mean, uh, it is true that uh, you are at least in some way anti-American if you don't support the war effort. <laughs> And it is true, at least in some way, that if you support uh, the war effort too enthusiastically, you're also uh, implicitly endorsing some of the excesses of, uh, of the Western um, civilization as it stands now, which is a bit shaky and a bit uh, filled with uh, rather toxic ideologies. Uh, both are true. Now, the solutions proposed both by the far left and the far right are ridiculous. The far left proposes essentially a full dedication uh, to the war effort much beyond than it, it's actually needed. So, you know, for instance, the... Full NATO intervention, Article 8... Uh, oh, uh, Article 5. Now, Article uh, 5, yeah. a full NATO intervention is not needed yet. Maybe it will be needed, maybe it won't. I suspect it won't, but, you know, in war things can change pretty fast. The, but I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to, for instance, take a shower while in two people. No, uh, yeah, essentially, yeah, from, uh... right? Uh, uh, keep only 18 degrees Celsius throughout the winter in your house. Now, screw you all. Uh, that's that th those kinds of adver that kind of, of advocacy actually increases the number of russophiles because you're essentially asking regular people to make sacrifices that first of all are not needed and second of all uh, may indeed be harmful for regular people and of course regular people will eventually reach the conclusion that uh, sacrifices are only required uh, from them uh, uh, and rather from from those uh, who make the decisions right the, the, not necessarily the rich but rather the politically privileged because not all of them are rich, but you know you can be politically privileged without being uh, rich necessarily. Uh, whereas the far right also comes with ridiculous solutions like, oh yeah, yeah, let's just cut any deal with Putin and stop the war because uh, uh, at least that will uh, save lives. And that's ridiculous. First of all, it won't. <laughs> and second of all, uh, since when uh, um, is uh, any invasion uh, automatically legitimate? I mean, that solution has been tried before. Right. Uh, appeasement to Putin has been tried uh, in 2014. With Crimea. Yeah, with Crimea. Of course, it wasn't internationally recognized, but no consequences, no serious consequences have been inflicted on the Putin regime as a result of the illegal annexation of Crimea. Yeah, sure, there were some sanctions, but even those were uh, intentionally broken by almost all Western countries. Uh, for instance, there was a the, the, there is an arms embargo on Russia since 2014, since the illegal annexation of Crimea. In reality, the arms commerce between the West, uh, especially France and Germany, and Russia actually stopped in April 2022. 
So it took another two, two months of slaughter inside Ukraine to finally convince West Europe to actually live by its word. So the solution proposed by the far right, namely to cut any deal with Putin and just, just appease them because it doesn't, it doesn't really matter, has been tried. And it's been proven by reality that it doesn't work. Now, with that said, that doesn't change the fact that there is uh, corruption uh, there. So both the extremes start from something reasonable, but the solutions that they propose are insane. Now, as, of, as to, to your point with uh, the shift, well, it's not necessarily a shift. You have to remember that uh, a significant portion, although n by, not by any means all, but a significant proportion of what is called the dissident right has uh, an impeccable track record of Putinism for more than six, seven, eight, nine years. Uh, it started uh, it, it, even a segment. It started with a segment of libertarians, with Ron Paul essentially saying that the referendum in Crimea uh, was legitimate, and that started the first segment of uh, Putinist dissident right. And then it uh, got advanced uh, through all sorts of other uh, institutions and influencers. I'm thinking here the National Policy Institute, for instance, which used to translate um, Dugin's books uh, into English. And there have been several others, uh, but not all of the dissident right fe fell in line with that. Uh, so some elements of the dissident right were like a bit more skeptical. Well, seriously, are we taking lessons from national Bolsheviks now? Eh, probably not. And then there's people like Tucker Carlson, which I don't consider a Putinist. To but Tucker Carlson is not a Putinist. Tucker Carlson is your typical old school American conservative, which is to say very ignorant about the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, whether it's him personally or the people who write his scripts, I, uh, as far as I uh, know, uh, the scripts that he reads uh, during his shows are sometimes written by him, sometimes written by someone else, sometimes a collaborative effort. Uh, and this is true with most um, uh, old school conservatives. But also with, um, I, I, I would not dare to say the majority of Americans in general, but definitely a very significant minority. You have to remember that uh, most Americans don't have a passport. Most Americans never leave the United States. Uh, maybe a week to Mexico into a very luxurious resort, and that's pretty much it. It is very possible from your hometown as well. Uh, there is a direct train from here to the neighboring country, and then uh, from there further on even into the war zone. So. It, 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 with as little as $20, you can go straight to the front lines in Ukraine. So, of course, we're going to have a very different view of the Ukrainian conflict than Tucker Carlson would have it from seven or 8,000 kilometers away, uh, where he would, um, he would essentially be much more limited in access to information. 